I'm very pleased to introduce Roy Seltzer, who's here from Double Negative, who's going to be doing some 2.5D relighting <laughs> techniques, which I believe are very impressive. So I'm going to hand over to Roy, and I hope that you enjoy it. Hello, everybody. Whoops, yeah, okay. I hope that's okay, volume-wise. Um, so yes, I'll be looking, we'll be looking at 2.5D um, relighting inside Nuke. Um, it's, some of the stuff will get a little bit technical. Um, it's, I'm going to try and balance that with sort of the actual uh, workflow challenges, shall we say, the caveats and whatnot. Uh, but basically what we'll be looking at um, this afternoon is um, ways of taking advantage of what are basically byproducts of um, 3D renders. So I'm referring to AOVs, the arbitrary output variables, which are typically um, rendered out at the same time as the, as the beauty. And um, two are of particular interest to us. One of them is the normals pass, and the other one is the point position pass. So, um, and then we'll be looking at those in detail, and then um, looking at different things that we can do uh, relighting wise and, and uh, um, masking wise with just those passes. They're very inexpensive to render because um, they are, I mean, they are byproducts of, 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 a, of a CG render pipeline. So, um, what's, but that makes them, that doesn't mean that they're um, not useful to us. In fact, they are extremely useful um, in, comp, in comp land, shall we say, because we have access to. Um, a lot of information that way in the form of images. Um, wh why is this so useful to us? Uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, it doesn't matter how complex your geometry gets. Um, if they're displacement maps or whatnot, the image isn't going to change in size, apart from if you change the resolution, of course. So you basically have the complexity for free with that just enormous pass like that. It's basically part of the render. Uh, the other thing is that we, are, we can treat it, since we have all that geometry data, we can um, throw the geometry per se out the window and treat it, but still retaining all that information, um, and treat the image as if it were the actual geometry we're dealing with. So that's very useful for our purposes, especially for relighting, where, of course, we need access to the 3D side of things. We need access to, we need to know which way the surfaces are, um, are pointing. And for some things like a rim light, we also need to know uh, where it is. So relative to the camera, you've got a wonderful image which looks like <clears throat> nothing at all, right? but gives us, again, if you look down, down here, you'll see lots of information. And there, when I hover over the magenta part or blue part, the colors, of course, don't matter, but what we have is, this time, the position of that point relative to us. So the position of um, here, here it says minus point, in the red, minus 0.7, in the green, minus 0.9, and in the blue, 9. What does that mean? Well, it means relative to our 0, 0, which is smack in the middle of the screen here, um, I'm, if I'm over here, I'm a little bit to the left, I'm a little bit down, and my object is nine units away from me, right? So we have a very accurate way of representing our geometry like that. We've got the, the normals, in other words, which way our object is facing, um, and uh, point position relative to the camera, in this case, um, which tells us exactly where the geometry is relative to us. With just those two passes, we can dive in the deep end, and we can get very make um, build ourselves a little rim light. Where just to bring up the parameters, there I have a rim light position where I can let's make this a little bit bigger. That fast enough for you? Huh? Moving around a rim light like that? 
Okay? This is just with the normals information and the point position information. Because here what I'm saying basically is, I have my light and I'm placing it, I want it here, relative to the scene and the camera. All right? Do the calculations necessary, hurry up about it, I want to see the rim light. All right? Now, we're not reinventing the wheel because, of course, rim lights exist in 3D. Right? But we're using the wheel for other purposes. In other words, it's a little bit painful, especially with a production pipeline, to have to go constantly back to 3D and ask for another uh, render, especially when it comes to things like rim lights, which really, you don't really know how well they fit in until it's time to actually do your final composite. <laughs> So having this control like this to, for additional lighting is, is um, what many compers want to have. Go on a show of hands. How many compers? Ooh, half. Fewer than I imagined. Okay. How many 3D then? Is it the other? You know, it should be the other half, but no. Okay. So there's... All right. So good display of compers. Okay. Um, so um, it's as you as you can see, we, we get with those passes, we get we get something which we can use very quickly inside a, inside a comp, which we can tweak, and then it's just a question of here I've got controls. Well, the first one, which is probably the most obvious, I mean, is position, right? Which I showed in two D, but of course, a light's going to be in three D, but then we have a slider for that, so we can push it back. This one says distance from camera. So if I push it back, naturally enough, you're going to see less and less of the rim effect. It's going to get tighter and tighter. Quick caveat immediately. You'll notice that I've got cracks and they're showing through. Why? Because it's the backside of the geometry. So um, we would definitely want to occlude that. But that's OK. We've got ambient occlusion at our disposal, another um, uh, pass. right? So nothing's to prevent us from actually um, occluding that. And if you look here now, then we've got rid of the cracks, the crack business, right? And we have just the rim effect. Nothing's to stop us from playing around with that and sort of increasing the amount, the width of it, right? and just how bright it is or not. Uh, and why not? I mean, what's to stop us from sort of um, correcting it, um, color correcting it? Yeah, because I'm sure you're all dying for a magenta light like that, right? <laughs> so um, once it's in comp land, once we have access to information like that, 3D information in comp land, we can all the usual comp tricks apply. And they all apply not only pretty much in real time, but on top of that, they apply um, relative to our final comp. So we can see it in situ. We can see it in the context, in its final context. But we still need the renders. So, you know, the 3D guys, you're not out of a job just yet. No? <laughs> I'll be making myself some enemies at this rate. Huh? <laughs> um, the rest, uh, so caveat, of course, like I said, is, is occlusion is something we have to add. So we've added, a, um, here we've already, um, if you look over where I'm over here, if you look in the detail. Incidentally, um, for picking it apart, I'm not going to, I'm not going to really pick apart these comps because I'm, uh, you're going to have this at your disposal, all of it. The tools, the actual setup here, um, uh, the, the gizmos, so you can play with it um, to your own, uh, to your heart's content. So there's no, no black magic and no black box solutions here. Um, you can occlude it. You have to occlude it. We we'll want to texture it to get the um, to get a little bit. Now we can use a texture pass or the beauty itself to get back some of the original colors, right? And then, so when we um, at the end, when we merge it, in other words, add it to our comp. If we take then just the uh, let's take the beauty here and then here and. Uh, and the end result. I'll blow that up a little bit. Is that clear? 
you can see the rim light. I think that's quite clear. Obviously, rim lights aren't exactly sort of in your face. I mean, after all, copying is very much like photography, isn't it? It's dodging and burning. The last thing you want to see is the actual dodging and burning itself. So, um, pull up the controls again here. I have that rim light position, right? There you go. So we're on the other side, just picking up the rim. Okay? Everybody can see that, can't they? All right. Brief pause because we're going to get into heavier stuff. So I want, really would like that to be crystal clear and not as clear as mud, but as clear as crystal. Uh, is it not clear for anybody? Or are there any questions already at this stage? If you're super quiet like that, I'm assuming that either you're asleep <laughs> or it's clear. <laughs> okay. Then um, let's move on to... So that was an example of sort of using a normal pass and a point position pass just to build a rim light um, in comp land and then apply it directly to our comp, move it around, place it where we want, um, color correct it the way we want, and basically are, um, uh, they're real-time rim lights. You can have as many of these as you want, because since we're feeding off very, uh, we're feeding off just two images, basically, to build it, uh, it's, it's very efficient, shall we say, as far as um, CPU time is concerned. So no major hits here uh, when it comes to the actual comp. Um, that's with the normals and pos point position light. Now we're going to con concentrate just on the normals because lots of stuff can be done with the normals. Um, uh, just with the normals, in other words, just with the direction that our ge geometry happens to be facing in. Um, and I'm going to dive in the deep end here and talk about spherical harmonics. Uh, which requires a little bit of theory, and we're going to have a look at um, fill lights based on that. But um, a few years back at SIGGRAPH 2001, a very smart guy called Ramamurti came up with a paper, uh, this paper here, an efficient representation for irradiance environment maps. What on earth does that mean? Um, what it meant is quite simply this. Um, back, back up until that point, um, already in 3D, your, your typical way of creating... Uh, let's, let's imagine this problem. You have an environment map. All right? You want ambient lighting and you want to exploit the, all the information in a high dynamic range environment map like these here, which you've probably seen. HDR, is that f everybody's familiar with that, right? No? Okay. Um, so you've got yourself uh, an environment map. And now it doesn't matter if it's a lat long map like this or if it's an angular map like this, commonly called by Dubovec um, a light probe. It doesn't matter what format it's in. But basically, what you have is a representation of your entire environment around you, um, in the, uh, the, the sphere, the ball all around you in all directions. And of course, um, it's become very popular. It's been popular for quite a while to sort of take into account the ambient lighting because when it comes, of course, to photorealistic results, a um, bunch of spotlights isn't going to really cut it. You need a little bit more info than that. And also, you need to take into account the high dynamic range, the fact that a light here, one of these lights is going to be in float, is going to be uh, 7, 8, 10, 15. Uh, so uh, an awful lot... Um, brighter than another one which, when it's tone mapped, looks just as washed out, like maybe over here, which is maybe only two. So um, it's become popular, like I said, to sort of use it, as I'm sure you know, sort of use um, environment maps for lighting purposes. Right? Except up until this point, with the way it was typically done, was a cluster of lights. So you'd have your whole sphere, you'd have your whole ball there, uh, sort of representing directional lights, sort of an, uh, a sphere at infinity, if you will, with lots of directional lights, a cluster of, oh, 200-odd lights, 
to actually sample from different parts, pull the colors from different parts of that sphere and use that to light your object. Now, as all of you know, 220 lights, um, even in Render Man, is a bit of a render hit, isn't it? So he came up with this I idea of using um, spherical harmonics instead to represent this map with only nine coefficients. Nine times three, because this is just RGB. If you look at the eucalypt eucalyptus grove, which is this map here, that's in lat long and that's, that's here, the actual showing you in reflection. Um, you're looking at nine coefficients times three for R, G, and B. Um, so with just nine numbers, you're representing the contribution of the entire sphere. Now, how is that possible? When you think that that's, so basically what you're saying, standard method here, what I'm saying here, standard method here, you have your 20, 220 lights or however else you want to do it um, in, uh, in a CG render. And the method that Ramamurti exposed here, as you can see, it's pretty much identical. The, the error is about 1%, right? using just nine um, numbers, nine coefficients. What on earth are those nine coefficients? Well, put it this, this way. Um, the, the conceit here is that instead of talking about it, uh, a light over here, a light over there, um, and getting the information and using those lights as if it were a spatial direction, we're looking at the whole thing in terms of frequency space. So we are cutting up that same sphere into spherical harmonic. Um, uh, spherical harmonics, and these are these are Legendre poly polynomial um, um, uh, derivatives. In other words, they are um, ways of cutting up our sphere. This is our ambient term, if you will. This is our ratio, top versus bottom, front versus back, left versus right, etc. So we're cutting up into the sphere into basis functions. In other words, different ratios between front and back, left and right, top and bottom and then a few minor ones as well. And Ramamurti showed that just with, these, just with these nine basis functions of splitting up the contribution of the sphere, sphere into just these nine ratios, if you will, we can reconstruct diffuse Lambertian, in other words, Lambertian lighting. <coughs> Everybody familiar with Lambertian? Shout no if you want an explanation. Okay. Um, everybody familiar with diffuse lighting? Okay. Um, your typical diffuse lighting is Lambertian lighting. It's also called dot lighting. Um, it's simply the dot product of your light vector and your normal, which turns out to be very simple, to, relatively simple to compute. Um, so or the most basic of models, of the analytic models that we have for, um, for lighting, for diffuse lighting, is Lambertian. Right. So this is recreating Lambertian lighting. But like I said earlier, instead of having to rely on a multitude, a whole cluster of lights, indicating sort of what the, what the color is from this direction or that direction, we're cutting up, we're saying, no, 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 we don't, want we don't want directions. Let's do this in frequency space. Let's cut up the sphere into these nice little functions here and then, and then calculate the coefficients and there we go. Um, so yeah, here's your standard way of doing it with lots of lights and here's Ramamurti's method with just these nine numbers. Nine times three, uh, like I said. All right. So which one would you prefer to go with? I'll go with, the, I'll go with the spherical harmonics, thank you very much. And as a result, what you have is lighting which is way faster. If you want to compare the two methods as far as speed is concerned, the speed up is between its orders of magnitude. In other words, um, anything between 110,000 times as fast. 
And if you have any doubts about that whatsoever, then here um, I will show you. Here's a one light that I have there. Was that instantaneous enough for you? Let's move it around, shall we? I want to pull that over here. Is that fast enough for you? Getting a little bit of a drag here. Oh, God, this is so slow. I think I'll have a coffee. <laughs> so w what the hell? I mean, w we've got one light. Let's have four. Okay. Why not? So what am I... And now we have four lights. Oh, why not just rotate the whole rig? I mean, I've got lighting here. It doesn't look too bad, yes, but I want to move the whole rig. I mean, after all, that's what you do. For example, in 3D, you have a lighting rig, uh, if you're serious about lighting, right? So you move all four lights around, right? Still a bit slow, isn't it? <laughs> um, so how did, we, uh, how did I go about doing this? Well, um, it's... The theory was Ramamurti's. I didn't in invent the wheel here. I mean, I just applied it a little bit differently. Instead of doing it in 3D, we used the normal pass. We used the normal pass again, which is just that here. And, um, and we used an environment map. And in this case, the environment map, let me show you what that looks like. Uh, let's go and inside here. Um, in case you're not that familiar with what are these tabs here, all I'm doing here is um, going from one tab to another. Okay, here's my actual script, if you will, right? And I've now gone into this tool, which is which is a gizmo. Um, so it's a group of nodes packed nicely, packaged together with lots of knobs for you to play with, right? Um, and I'm going over to that quite simply um, by clicking. I've clicked the S here to show it, and I've moved over to um, the actual um, insides, the innards of this gizmo here. So when you see me clicking between here, all I'm doing is going from the script itself into that gizmo. And as you can see, the actual gizmo itself is bigger than the script. But that's not a problem. And um, I'm diving in here because, well, I want to do is show you the actual environment map that I'm using for this. So let's go here. And we want to have two viewers. So there we go, two viewers. Let's flip back over here to the no graph. OK. So that's the lighting we're creating right there, right? This is what we're using. And I'm going to switch off, for the sake of clarity, I'm going to go back into these lights and switch some of them. And we'll keep the right light, shall we? And switch off the others. And we'll keep just the, uh, the right light here, which we want to uh, reset some of the stuff to zero here. Yeah. OK. dive quickly back down here. This is the, this is what I'm using as a map, as an environment map, all right? You can use any environment map, like you saw with the eucalyptus grove and the in interior of, of the church and whatnot. I mean, it doesn't matter wh whatsoever. Um, I just said to myself, well, okay, well, why not, why don't we do um, what's to stop us from taking a softbox and um, making a high dynamic range environment map of that, like here, and then using that as a fill light? Calculate the coefficients ahead of time. We have them all with coefficients. We can just throw the map away. We've got the information. We're basically representing the contribution of a softbox. Right? That's all we're doing here. So um, just, to, oops, uh, just to quickly show you here, here we have our, 
here we have two. It's, it's, it's got this funny pattern quite simply because there are four spheres here. Let me quickly... Uh, there we go. All right. That's our right light completely. Let's put it back into position. Okay. That's our light coming from the right. So as you can see, it's just, uh, um, this is only for, I'm doing this for visualization purposes, just so that we have an idea of where it's actually coming from, because we're not using the geometry, right? We've got, we've calculated the coefficients, we have our normals map, we're just um, calculating, um, we're rendering on the fly, if you will. All right, but the idea is that's us in the middle behind the camera. We're looking this way, and the, the light is coming from the right. And the result is this. So that when I move that around, the right light here, move it to 10. OK, you can see both viewers update. All right, shall we? And Around the merry-go-round, we go again. This is obviously behind. You're not expecting it to be lit when I'm placing the, the, the thing behind, are you? All right? It's behind. If it's behind, it's behind. Let's bring it back. Still so slow, isn't it? All right. We have one fill light there like that, which um, and we have a three D representation in Nuke. I've I've gone over to the three D space, and and all it is is a sphere mapped with our environment map, so that we can see where it is relative to us. Um, that's the only purpose that this serves. But the result is here, so you can compare the two like that. And if you've done if you've done one sphere with one light, well then here. Like I said, you can build an entire lighting rig and have um, a, I don't know, a, a bottom light, a bounce light as well. And move that around, etc. Okay? Keep it to one just for the sake of simplicity. This is the actual lighting itself. Uh, this is adding the texture pass to it. And since it's a gizmo, it's easiest to do that way and to do it um, actually inside the gizmo. And like I said, I'm, I'm giving these away. These, these will be, you will have this material so you can, you, can, uh, you can dissect it, all right? But simply put, you've got your normals input and your alpha. You're rotating the entire rig here. You've got each light here. Um, and you're comping it with uh, with the texture coming, coming in from your AOV pass. And hey presto. So you've got the innards, if you will, uh, of Ramamurti's equation there here, which probably won't fit on the screen, but then, okay, it's a little bit long. Right. But it's actually quite simple. As it's already, uh, what I mean by quite simple is, is really, um, the beauty of something like this is it's been reduced to simply a bunch of a few multiplications and some additions, which means as far as a computer is concerned, hey, I'll do that, I can do that, bam, I'll do it just like that. Now, we can keep, I'll go back to the, to the note graph and the fill lights here. So, so here's our gizmo, okay, and... Um, We'll go back to our other view, which is the actual result. And here I'm simply adding it to the beauty. So to compare the two, you can see I've got a, I've, I've got a fill light to the right, right? Which we've created entirely with just the normals pass in our pre-calculated softbox. There's nothing to stop us from actually doing the other, th the, uh, the, uh, the other way around. I mean, here we're adding light, right? But we can also subtract the light because you saw the, envir you saw the environment map, just a soft box with lots of black around it. Well, you can use it as a negative light too. I mean, all that black around it, let's suck some light out of our scene. 
Right? If the light's coming from this side, from the right-hand side like here, what's to stop us from taking the black part and sucking it out, right? Which is what this bright shade is, right? And if I push that a little bit, you'll quickly see right, that I'm actually, let me show you what, that's with the, the two added together. Let's do a one, two, three, a proper one, two, three. One, beauty, two, our actual lighting, and three, um, added to the beauty. Right? So that's our lighting. If I increase, this is what I had before. If I increase it, I'm, you see how from the opposite direction, from all the other directions basically, other than right, I'm sucking the light out. Right? And the great thing about spherical harmonics is, you remember how I showed you those different, um, those different uh, basis functions there? The idea of the first term, the most important, the ambient, the global contribution of the whole map. Here with this one, top versus bottom. Here, front versus right, left versus, uh, front versus, hello. Front versus back, left versus right. So we can, since they're part of our equation, what's to stop us from increasing one or decreasing it, right? For example, we have the ambient contribution here, the ambient ratio, all right? That's how our whole map because in the blackness I was talking about, it's not fully black, is it? It's a little bit above black, so it's still, con it's still contributing to the overall result. So here's a full contribution of the entire sphere. But if I say, okay, reduce this to zero, notice how it's acting a little bit like a fall off, isn't it? I'm saying I'm, ex I'm excluding the entire sphere and, and focusing on just where it's lightest. You've got another freebie here, which I'm going to, um, just a few um, uh, functions which I'm, I'm going to briefly look at, which I've added. Here, this is a spread function. Now, this is, just a, this is just a contrast, a means of doing contrast. But the effect, I'll show you in a second but, um, how that's built, but um, the effect is, um, is actually Perlin, Perlin gain function, which allows you to control the spread. It has the effect of, as you would expect a little bit, the, um, uh, the, the, the divider, the actual fall off of the light right, by increasing the local contrast. So there's a lot we can do which are really comp tricks once we've set this up with a normal pass and basically have created our own lighting. Okay? Any questions so far? Who's asleep? No. Okay. Is that clear as crystal? Limitations the limitations are, yes, the caveats are always going to be the same. One, you rely on occlusion techniques because in 3D terms it's still relatively simple lighting, albeit a lot, lot faster and doing in real time actually in comp, so in context if you will. So you rely, you, you're still dependent on um, occlusion information shadows and ambient occlusion, you need it to control your light. And the other, the other caveat um, I would say is um, you, it doesn't pay to expect techniques like this to replace 3D lighting. What it allows you to do is to enhance the 3D lighting, so control it because all the same with speculars and, and, and a lot of the, uh, the shading that goes on um, with, um, uh, I don't know, with the Lafayette Fortune um, specular or, um, or, or whatnot, um, there are, um, or, or um, with, with calculations like um, um, subsurface scattering or things like that, you can't do any of that with techniques like that, like this. So um, you, can't, you can't place the expectations too high. On the other hand, you can control the lighting that you have and you can add to it in real time in a way which is just, from the point of view of a pipeline, is just far, far quicker and more realistic than throwing it back to 3D. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah? Great. Okay. 